So um, today, can we get the, uh, the images up, please? Good. Today, we're going to try to answer one question. And it's a question that I think many of you ask yourself several times a week. And the question is, does my dog really love me, or does she just want a treat? <laughs> How many people ask themselves that question all the time? Right? OK. So I think it's just very easy to see that, yes, of course, our dog loves us. It's just very obvious what's going on in those furry little heads. And we need ask no further, right? Or maybe not. <laughs> maybe it's not so easy to know what's going on in those furry little heads. But something is going on. Of that, I'm sure. I don't think you could say to me that, oh, nothing's going on. But there's another thing that occurs to me in asking these questions, which is, why is our question about them always, do they love us? Do you love me is a question about me. It's not a question about them. So I needed a different question, because that wasn't getting me anywhere. So my question became, who are you? Who are you is a very different question than do you love me? Because that's a question about them. That is a question that could open a door. We know that there are capacities of the human mind. Many of us have all of these capacities. The question is, are these capacities of only the human mind? What's going on in the other brains that share this planet with us? Is it possible, as many people have said for decades, that absolutely nothing is going on? Is that possible? And if it's not possible, how could we possibly find ways in? Well, for decades, scientists have said, many scientists have said, there is no way in to the inner experience of other creatures. And so that is not a scientific question. But there are ways in. There are several good ways in. You can look at brains, you can consider evolution, and you can watch what they do. So let's do those things. This is Joyce Poole. She's a famous elephant scientist. That's not an elephant. That is a jellyfish. Why do I have Joyce who studies elephant behavior with a jellyfish? Well, partly because she sent me that photo. But the other reason is that jellyfish were the first creatures that had nerve cells, neurons. And then jellies evolved into chordates, and chordates evolved into vertebrates. Vertebrates came out of the ocean and built places like the Aspen Institute, and here we all are. But it remains true that a nerve cell is basically the same thing still. Whether that nerve cell is in a jellyfish or in a dog, a chimpanzee, you, a crayfish, basically a nerve cell is a nerve cell. So what does that have to say about the mental experience or the emotional experience of something like a crayfish if their nerve cells are like our nerve cells? Well, it doesn't say anything, really, I don't think. But it turns out that if you have crayfish in a tank, and every time they come out from cover to try to explore, you give them a tiny little electrical shock, they will develop what looks like an anxiety disorder. And they will kind of shut down and stop exploring. But if you put into the water the same drug used to treat anxiety disorder in humans, they relax and they come out and explore. So that's pretty interesting. So how do we treat the possibility of anxiety in crayfish? We boil them by the millions. Octopuses are mollusks. Their last common ancestor with us was a worm about 700 million years ago. And their intelligence evolved completely separately from vertebrate intelligence. Their nervous system is totally different from ours. And yet, they can recognize individual humans. They play. They're crafty. They use tools as well as do most apes. How do we honor the ape-like intelligence of Octopuses, and that's the right way to say it, we boil them. On coral reefs, there are fish called groupers. And groupers chase 
small fish, sometimes a small fish will go to cover in the coral or in the rocks. And when that happens, the grouper will sometimes go to where it knows a moray eel is sleeping, and it has a way to signal to the moray eel, come and follow me. And the moray understands that signal, often follows. The grouper then says, it's here. The moray knows what that means and goes in. Sometimes the moray catches the fish, sometimes the fish bolts, and the grouper catches it. So they both know that they sometimes will get rewarded and sometimes not, but on average it's going to work for both of them. This is an interspecies hunting partnership, something exceptionally rare. Uh, almost nothing else does that except people with dogs and falcons. But this has probably been going on in coral reefs for millions of years, and we've only known about it for about 15 years. And when I say we, I mean the 17 of us who read that paper. So how do we honor the ancient interspecies hunting partnership of the grouper? What do you think? No, fried. <laughs> now, a pattern is emerging in our relationship with all these animals, and this pattern says a lot more about us, unfortunately, than it says about them. Teaching is when you stop doing what you're doing to take time away from what you're trying to accomplish to show a child or a companion how to do something. That's teaching. Humans, of course, teach. Chimpanzees do not teach. They, the young ones learn a lot by watching, but the adults don't actually teach. But sea otters do teach. Killer whales do a lot of teaching, sometimes some very complicated things that take months to teach and to learn. And killer whales share just about everything that they catch. So there are things going on out there that most of us aren't too aware of or don't think about too much. Now, if you look at the evolution of brains, because in the living world, everything is on a range, right? And if you look at the human brain compared to a mouse brain, what you see is that there's a basic mammalian brain, and mice have a relatively simple one, and humans have a relatively complicated one. And that's the way evolution always works. It doesn't just come up with some new thing all of a sudden. It looks at the parts that it has on the shelf, what's in stock, it takes those things and it fabricates a new twist. So that's how evolution works. Everything is on a range. That's the living world. Okay. If you look at a human brain and a chimpanzee brain, you see that basically what we have is just a big chimpanzee brain. And it's a good thing that ours is bigger because we're also the most insecure of all of the apes. But, uh-oh, that's a dolphin. Now that brain is a lot bigger and a lot more complicated. What does that tell us about dolphin intelligence? It actually doesn't tell us anything definitive because dolphins have sonar. It's kind of possible, in fact, it's fairly likely that a large part of that brain is given over to the very, very fine processing of acoustic signals, not to intelligence. That's possible. So you can't really see a mind by looking at a brain. However, you can see the workings of minds in the logic of behaviors. And so our mind makes sense of this exactly as the elephants are making sense of their situation and exactly as they are executing behavior based on the logic of the situation, which is they have found a patch of shade under the palms to let their babies go to sleep. While the babies are go to, going to sleep, the big ones doze, but they only doze because the world is a dangerous place. They can't afford to totally let their guard down. They can afford to let their babies totally let their guard down. But they face outward and they touch one another. We understand that perfectly, exactly as they understand it. Because on the same plane, under the arc of the same sun, listening to the whoops and the roars of the same enemies, we became who we are, and they became who they are. And we've been neighbors for a very long time. 
These elephants do not look relaxed. They're concerned about something. What could they be concerned about? Could be any one of a number of things. It turns out, for instance, one of the things elephants are concerned about is whether they're hearing certain kinds of people or not. If you record human voices saying, look, there are some elephants in English and in Maasai, and you play the recording back to elephants from a speaker hidden in the bushes where there is no scent to cue them to people or the presence of people or what kind of people, there's only the sound of the language and they're saying the same thing, it turns out that when they hear English, they ignore it because English-speaking people don't hurt them. But when they hear it in Maasai, they bunch up and they run away because Maasai people carry spears and sometimes they get into confrontations with elephants at water holes where they're trying to get water for their goats or their cows and sometimes they hurt elephants. Elephants know not only that there are different kinds of animals and one of them is people, they know there are different kinds of people and some of them are okay and others are potentially dangerous. They know us better than we know them. They've been watching us for longer than we've been watching them and they've been watching us more carefully than we've been watching them. As mammals and in fact as basically all living things, we pretty much all have the same basic life with the same imperatives. Stay alive, find food, keep your babies alive. That is basically what our life is about. They do it. They're mammals, we're all mammals. Under the skin and under those different looking surface contours, we're all basically the same. Elephants are outfitted for hiking. Whales are out outfitted for diving. But in the flippers of whales are the exact same bones that are in your hand. The same five fingers are in those flippers. We all have the same skeleton. We all have the same organs. We all have the same nervous system. We all have the same hormones that create mood and motivation. Under the skin, we are all kin. We are literally one evolved family, all related. And so we see things that make sense that we all recognize. We see helping in social animals, especially helping of the young. We see curiosity as the young are exploring the world and learning things for the first time. We see deep bonds of family affection. And not just mammals. We recognize this as we begin to move away from our closest relatives. Dancing is dancing. And then we ask a really weird question. We say, but are they even conscious? I think that's a very strange thing to ask. When you get total anesthesia, it makes you unconscious. What that means is that you stop having any felt experience. There's no mental experience. You are disconnected from all your sensory input. When you come out of anesthesia, you regain consciousness. You begin to see, smell, hear. You begin to have thoughts. They have eyes. They have noses. They have ears. They see, they smell, they hear. They play with each other and have fun. Yes. They are conscious. Stop asking that question. <laughs> there are many things that people try to claim are the thing that makes us human. And one of the things they claim is empathy makes us human. That's just one example out of several. All right, but it turns out that empathy is one of the oldest things that is a capacity of basically all group living animals. Because empathy is just your mind's ability to match the mood of your companions. So if you live in a group, you have to have empathy. When it's time to hurry up, you got to hurry up. You don't sit around talking about it. You need instant empathy. The oldest form of empathy is called contagious fear. If you're on the beach with 300 of your companions and they all suddenly startle and fly away, 
It does not work if you stand there saying, gee, I want to know exactly why everybody just left. <laughs> That's not going to work for you. They have contagious fear. We have contagious fear. Anybody have money in the stock market? You know what contagious fear feels like. So as I said, everything in life is on a range. But within that range, we can create certain categories that help us think about it. On the empathy range, I have these three kind of categories that I've uh, used to think about it. Basic empathy, that, that automatic mood matching. The other one, a little bit more removed, I call sympathy. You don't feel it at the moment, but you understand it. You say, I, I'm sorry to hear that your great-grandmother passed away. You never met, maybe met, never met her. She's not part of your family. You're not grieving, but you understand. That's sympathy. If you are moved to act, you want to help out of sympathy, I call that compassion. So that's a range of empathy that helps me think about this. Human empathy, far from being the thing that makes us human, is actually very far from perfect. For one thing, we round up empathic animals, kill them, and eat them. All right, maybe that's not fair. Maybe that's just because we're predators. But the fact of the matter is, we're not really too great to each other either. People who know only one thing about animal behavior seem to know a very, very awkward vocabulary word, anthropomorphism. And they know that you must never do this. And what this is is attributing human thoughts and emotions to any other species. That seems to be a rule. But what if these other species do have exactly some of the same thoughts and emotions that we have? What if they feel the same when they're afraid? What if they feel the same when they're enraged? What if they feel the same when they are moved to be near someone they love? And we make a rule that says you can't do that. I'm not sure that that's scientific. In fact, I'm sure it's not. It's not scientific to say easily, oh, they're hungry when they're hunting, and oh, they're exhausted when their tongues are hanging out, and then when they're playing in the, in the mud with their babies, say, geez, we can't possibly say that they feel joy or happiness. In fact, we don't even know if they're conscious. That is not scientific. It's a rule we've made for ourselves. Why do we have that rule? I think it's because admitting that they may have some of these emotions kind of messes up our favorite story. And our favorite story is we're the only ones that matter, and we're totally special. And another reason is that it would be very, very inconvenient for us to think or to understand that many other forms of life out there value their existence and try to have a good time. So I was being interviewed about this book, Beyond Words, when it first came out. And I was saying all these kinds of things. And I thought I was doing a very good job explaining, like I think I am now. And then the reporter said, OK, you're saying all this stuff. But how do I really, really know that you really know that other animals can think and feel anything. So I did what Brian Hare yesterday said he did. I immediately started to try to think, what's the published research paper that I can immediately pull up in my memory to make the case? And then I realized that the answer to the reporter's question was lying right there on the rug. Because when my pup comes over to me and rolls over on her back, now she doesn't go over to the sofa or the dining room table and roll over on her back. She comes to me and rolls over on her back. And that's because she has had a thought. And the thought is, I would like my belly rubbed. <laughs> and I know I can go to him because we are family. And I know that if I roll over on my back, he will know exactly what I'm asking for. And I know from experience that he knows how to do this and make it feel good. So she has thought and she has felt. And it's not really much more complicated than that. If you think that's not scientific enough, well, there's plenty of new science. People put dogs in MRI machines. They watch their brains light up in ways that are similar to the way our brains light up when they show them pictures of dogs they know or people they love. 
And our brains light up the same way when we get those same kinds of pictures in the same kinds of tests. You ever think your dog is dreaming? Well, we can watch rats dream. Those images are the brain, the brain scans of a dreaming rat. So many of our impressions are correct. They are being borne out by typical kinds of academic science that proves what's going on in the world. Now, when we look at wild animals, usually we put a label on them. That's the species name. And then we think we're done. We say, oh, I saw some elephants. Oh, look, those are killer whales. Oh, I went to Yellowstone. I saw wolves. That's not how they see themselves. That long-finned male over there, he was 36 years old when I took that picture. They are members of the L-Pod off Washington State. The one on his left is a 44-year-old cousin. They've known each other for decades. They have traveled thousands of miles through the ocean together. They know where they are. They know who they're with. When they're separated by quite a few miles, maybe 10 miles in water where you can only see 50 feet, they can hear each other. They can recognize their voices among dozens of other killer whales. They know what family they belong to. They can always come back together. This is an elephant named Philo. When elephant males get to be about 15 years old, they begin to leave their natal family while the females stay together for life. And the males start wandering around. They form these little bachelor groups. Eventually, when they're about 30, they begin to breed. So he, I think, is showing a little teenage swagger here. He has recently left his birth group. And, and that's, that's Philo in Samburu Reserve in Kenya. And this is Philo four days later. Humans are not only capable of feeling grief. We generate an incredible amount of it. In this case, there's a really great reason. We want to carve their teeth. Why don't we wait for them to die? Their teeth would be bigger. When I first went to Africa in my 20s, elephants occupied vast swaths of land. Now they occupy small, isolated patches. In Roman times, elephants lived from the shores of the Mediterranean all the way to the Cape of Good Hope, except for the harshest parts of the Sahara. That map is the geometry of the greatest animal on land being driven to extinction so we can carve their teeth. That's us. Of course, we take much better care of wildlife in our own country, here in the Rockies. We paid the park rangers of Yellowstone to exterminate the last wolves south of Canada. And they did that in the 1920s. That was wildlife management. It was a big mistake. So 60 years later, we brought wolves back into Yellowstone. And they began doing what wolves do. They also began doing something wolves had never done before, which is they began to support a kind of major tourism industry of people who go to Yellowstone just to see wolves, because it's the best place in the world to see free living wolves. And people doing that just to see wolves spend about $30 million a year going to see the wolves of Yellowstone, which vastly, vastly, vastly uh, is more than the value of all the livestock wolves kill um, anywhere in the continental United States. But in the fall of 2012, somebody in Congress highlighted the word wolf on the endangered species list, and then they hit the delete key. So as soon as this family of wolves, the best watched wolves in the world, put a paw outside an imaginary line called Yellowstone National Park, the first thing that happened was one of the adults got shot. They, they retreated back into the park. The adult that got shot was the brother of the breeding male. Now, I should say a wolf pack is a nuclear family. It has a mom and dad and their babies of the last two or three years. 
when those young ones become adolescents, they leave trying to find their own stake in the world. They live in nuclear families just like we do. That's why we have wolves in our home in the form of dogs, and we don't have our closest relative, chimpanzees, in our home, because chimps do not live in nuclear families. They don't understand how to do that, and wolves do. That's why we have them. So that male got shot. They went back out. The female got shot. The breeding female got shot. Now this family was in tatters. And the first thing that happened was the children started fighting. This had never happened before. Sisters drove the most, um, sort, of the, sort of the most talented of the young ones, the best hunter, the most popular one. They drove her out. I watched that happen. She kept trying to come back to her family. They would not let her in. Meanwhile, the father on the right there, he started wandering all over the place. He may have been looking for his mate and his brother. When he did that, two young males came in to seize the opportunity of taking over his family, which had by then several females who were breeding age. So he lost everything. He lost his mate and his brother, his entire hunting support, and his hunting territory going into winter. Now she was of the age when she should have left anyway the following spring. So I thought, okay, that's nasty, but she'll be fine. He's doomed. What happened was three months later, she was shot starving at somebody's chicken coop, and he survived. Three years after that, he had a new territory, a new mate, and pups. The point of all of that detail in that whole story is they have lives. It's not just here are six wolves. They're not all equal. The trajectory of their lives changes when we kill some of them. Just like in our families, when somebody dies, it could change the trajectory of the rest of our lives. They have lives, we have lives. They're not just numbers. We hurt them so much that sometimes I wonder, why don't they hurt us more than they do? How is it that this killer whale, who has just finished eating part of a gray whale that he and his companions have killed, how is it that he is absolutely no danger to the people in that little boat, who happen to be a couple of the best killer whale researchers in the world? Wild killer whales have never hurt a human being. I watched that one tear a seal into three pieces with two of his companions. That tiny boat came around the corner with two people who each weigh as much as a seal. They had nothing at all to fear. They stopped to take pictures. They eat seals. Why don't they eat us? It strikes me as odd that we can trust them around our toddlers. Two scientists in two different countries have essentially the same story, and it goes like this. We were following killer whales to study their behavior. They were being a little evasive. We went into a fog bank. We lost them, and we were also lost, because it was days before GPS. So we said, OK, let's just try to get the compass out and put the cameras away and head for home. We started heading for home, and suddenly, the whales that had been evasive are all in front of the boat. So we said, OK, let's just follow the whales. They followed them for 15 miles in the fog, and when the fog broke, the researcher's house was right on the shoreline in front of them, and the whales went away. In the Bahamas, there's a woman who studies spotted dolphins, and usually she goes for about a week at a time, and the dolphins, she knows all the dolphins individually, she knows who belongs to who, who is whose child, who is whose aunt, and they usually recognize the boat. They come and they bow ride, and it's a joyful kind of a reunion. And one day, they go, they see the dolphins. The dolphins will not come near the boat. And she says to the captain, God, what is wrong with the dolphins today? They're acting so weird. And then suddenly, somebody comes up from below and announces that someone on the boat has died during a nap in his bunk. Now. How would the dolphins know that one of the human hearts has stopped? And why would they care at all about that? And why would it spook them? 
I don't know the answers to any of these stories, but I do know one thing that it means. It means that there is much, much more going on in the minds that share this planet with us than anything that we ever consider. They are basically invisible to us, but there's a lot going on out there that we don't think about. In an aquarium in South Africa, there, is a there was a little baby bottlenose dolphin nursing age. Her name was Dolly. And one day, one of the keepers was outside, and he was looking through the window on a break. He was smoking a cigarette, just watching the dolphins while he was on a cigarette break. And Dolly, the little nursing age bottlenose dolphin, came over to the glass, and she looked at him just for a few seconds. Then she went back to her mom, and she nursed. And she swam back to the window, and she released all the milk, and it enveloped her head like a cloud of smoke. Now, <laughs> when a human uses something to represent something else, we call that art. Somehow, a nursing age bottlenose dolphin got an idea to use milk to represent whatever it is that guy is doing. The things that make us human are not the things we think and tell ourselves are the things that make us human. <laughs> we see some of everything that we have, we can see some of it in some other living thing. But here's what I think makes us human. We are the most extreme animal. It's not that there's one thing we do and they don't do any of it. We do it in the extreme. We are the most compassionate but we're also the cruelest, and we are the most creative, but we're also the most destructive animal that has ever existed, and we are all of those things all jumbled up together. But love is not the thing that makes us human. We're not the only ones who care about our mates. We're not the only ones who take tremendous care of our babies. Albatrosses, one of my favorite birds, they nest on the remotest islands in the biggest oceans in the world, as far from a continent as they can be. This is Laysan Island in the middle of the North Pacific Ocean. We don't have any idea they're even there, but boy, do they know about us. Adults sometimes travel for three weeks at a time to bring back one meal for a waiting chick. And nowadays, that meal frequently includes things like the screw top to a peanut butter jar. All of them have plastic in them. It's never good for them, and sometimes it kills them. This albatross was six months old and ready to fly and died. And that bird was packed with red cigarette lighters because plastic smells like food to seabirds. Now, this is not the relationship we are supposed to have with the rest of life on Earth. But it is the relationship we literally do have. It's not just me saying so. It's pain and death for animals whose existence we're not even aware of on the same planet that we live on. And yet, when we are expecting new human life, we paint animals on the nursery room walls. We don't paint cell phones. We don't paint work cubicles. We paint animals. We don't even understand why we do. But I think I know why. I think it's because we have a blessing, an unconscious blessing for our unborn child. And that blessing is, welcome to this beautiful world. We're not alone we have company. But every one of those animals, in every painting you ever see of Noah's Ark, deemed worthy of salvation by the Creator, every one of those is in mortal danger now. And their flood is us.
So earlier in the talk, I talked a little bit about evolution, and I hope this is not the ultimate trajectory of it, but it's kind of what we are living out at the moment. We think of ourselves as the pinnacle of creation. That's, that's the Western story. There are artists who try to give us a view of evolution, and they do things like this, which I think is a very strange kind of uh, tree of life there with pterodactyls still alive, apparently, right along with eagles, apes, and naked people. Um, it looks like sharks went extinct a long time ago. I can't really even make any sense out of this. This is a more accurate depiction, which is there are a lot of things here on Earth with us. They've made the whole journey. We are relative newcomers. They're old. They're still here. They've been under selective forces the whole time. They didn't just stop a long time ago. If you look at the right there, that's a little bit more of a detailed depiction. And if you look at this depiction, you can't understand anything. And this is just birds. This is just birds. And this is life on Earth. We're really not capable of understanding it. And that's why we don't understand that we live in a miracle. There are things called the laws of physics. Why are they called the laws of physics? Because they apply everywhere in the universe. The speed of light is the speed of light everywhere. Gravitational attraction works the same everywhere. Life is not happening everywhere. What do you call something that doesn't correspond to the laws of physics? You call that a miracle. There's only one place in the universe that we know right now has life. And what we can tell from that is that it's at least a rare thing. It's not like the speed of light that happens everywhere. We live in a miracle, but our minds cannot comprehend that fact. And if we don't value it that way, if we don't see it as something moral, we won't get a grasp on it at all. So we started this talk by asking, do they love us? And we're just going to invert that question and ask whether we have the mental and emotional capacity to simply let them exist. Thank you very much. I see that we have a few minutes for some questions or comments. Yes, sir. They, they want you to wait for the mic, but I, I can repeat your question. The question is, how did I get interested, and did I have a dog as a boy? Um, my, I, we, I, was, um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and we lived in a tenement flat until I was 10 years old. There wasn't really what you would call wildlife. Um, but my father's hobby was raising canaries. And I think that had a big influence on me, because unlike a lot of kids who live in rural areas, I could, I could watch birds from inches away. I could watch them getting on and off their eggs. I could watch eggs hatching. I could see them feeding their babies. And then uh, when I was seven years old, my father caved into my demands that I must have homing pigeons now. So we, at that time, you know, having homing pigeons or, or having pigeons in the cities was kind of a not uncommon hobby. A lot of people had pigeon lofts on roofs and you'd see them flying in circles. So anyway, I raised homing pigeons from the time I was seven till the time I was 10 when we moved to the suburbs uh, and that was the end of my pigeon raising career. But um, when, you raise homing, when you raise pigeons, you, you, ha you have a coop and you, you stack up boxes for them to breed. We used to use like peach crates. And you put a bowl in there and you put nesting material in one part of the coop. 
and they sort themselves out and they squabble over who's going to be whose mate and sometimes they fight and sometimes they're very peaceful. They, they have babies, the adults leave during the day, they fly around, they come back in the evening, they feed the babies and they go to sleep in their stack of peach crates. And across the yard, we lived in a stack of boxes where the adults figured out who they were going to be mating with and they left during the day and they came back at night and took care of their babies and then we all went to sleep. And it seemed to me um, when I was in my single digits that our lives were their lives. We were, we were all living the same life, it just differed in the details. Then I went away to you know, college and university. I was taught that all of that was wrong. Uh, and then I started studying seabirds where I sat in blinds and I watched these birds have their lives. And I, I, I really believe that my impression when I was seven and eight years old is true. Um, all our lives in the broad strokes are basically the same. It's all part of one family of life on earth. Yes, sir. Extraordinary presentation. Oh, thank you. Moving. I'm sitting here asking myself, how can I leave here and ever eat meat again? You have to have been asked that question a million times after this presentation. Are you a vegetarian? I'm just curious how you deal with that. Yeah. Um, is there any chance we could get the images back up where we left off? So no, no one ever asks me this question. And um, my basic answer is that little line in parentheses there. I eat some from the soil, some from the sea, none from the pens. So um, I live on Long Island. We can go fishing, we can go clamming. Um, so that makes me not a vegetarian. I never buy meat, from, meat of farmed animals. And the reason is that it's not that we make them die, because everything is going to die. It's not so bizarre to die. But what is really bizarre is to make them live miserably. No predator makes its prey live miserably. The prey gets to be who it is until the moment it's killed. So that's sort of my justification for going fishing. The prey gets to be who it is until I catch it. I eat it. It's a big part of my life. Uh, turned with my other earlier career, I was a marine conservationist. I worked a lot on fisheries policy reform. I tried to really give back to the ocean. When we farm, we take the land, and it can no longer grow anything except what we're growing on it. If you catch one fish out of the sea or a few fish out of the sea, you don't hurt the sea's ability to make more fish. I think that is a fundamental difference. That's, that's why uh, I still eat fish. But the fact that we make farmed animals live much more miserably than we make them die is why I don't buy meat from farmed animals. There are also really good environmental reasons um, for not eating meat, the contribution of methane and global warming and all that kind of stuff. But basically, these are some of the questions I ask myself, some of the filters I go through. One thing I apply is what I call the hypocrite test, which is, would you kill it? Most people say, oh, I would never kill a cow, I would never kill a pig. Well, why, why are you okay with eating pork? And they say, well, I, because I didn't have to kill it. So, you know, to some people that's just okay to me, I, I would rather take responsibility for the whole thing, you know, and if I'm not willing to, then I, then I think I shouldn't. So that's another reason. Uh, yes? Um, uh, apropos of the plastic in the oceans. Oh, sorry. Yes, plastic uh, in the oceans. Uh, your photographs of the plastic in the oceans. Um, I understand there are uh, new discoveries that can begin to eat the plastics, or there are ways that people are considering to be able to get rid of the plastics in the oceans. Right. Can you talk a little bit about them? And yeah, well, I, I think that um, you can the kind of plastics that we have formulated are, you know, really remarkable because they basically, there's nothing that, com that decomposes them. They, they only break up. They don't break down. And they're extraordinarily useful because of that. But if you buy yogurt in a plastic container, why is it that we package something that lasts three weeks in an eternal material? Why is there such a huge, huge mismatch between the use and the material? So there are probably some things that we will always want to use 
plastic for. But there are a lot of things for which uh, we use it once we throw it away. It should never be packaged in plastic. But there are a lot of people, so I think plastic is basically a nightmare. Um, but there are a lot of people working on things that behave like plastic, except they really do break down and decompose. Uh, and there are a number of companies working on this. They're, they're made of truly decomposable material, some of which have different bases, like uh, they're, they're built on a, a fungal matrix and things like that. And if you look at them in your hand uh, and you feel them and you use them, they seem like plastic, but they're not. And that is the answer. The answer is, 100 years ago, we didn't have plastic. 100 years from now, we shouldn't have plastic. We should have new materials that people are working on that do the job we want, but behave in the world that uh, is a way that the world can actually absorb. Um, yes, how about all the way over there? Um, I think it's important to point out that all of these are that. Yes, I noticed that. In fact, I took a photo of that and I sent it to somebody who works with me. At this conference, um, it looks like a lot of thought has gone into making all of the plastic-like material that we have um, actually um, compostable, and the sorting is such that it looks like they will get to the right kind of facilities. So um, I thank the organizers here for that. I, I certainly noticed that. Uh, yes, dear, in the back. Um, hi. When we look at these issues and think about the underlying contributing problems, I think one that comes up a lot is our perception of the, the socio-zoological scale. And I was wondering if there's anything we can do to contribute to how we perceive that and change that sort of underlying understanding of what animals are worth. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the answer is sort of implicit in your question. Um, Animals are here on this planet. We're here on this planet. They, they belong here as much as we do. They belong here equally to us. That's not to say that I value a human life exactly the same as I value the life of any other species. You know, I, I will kill a bluefish for dinner. I wouldn't kill a person because I'm hungry, um, at least in any foreseeable scenario. But um, the, the right of species to exist, and especially the need for us to leave them room, because we understand that their moral claim to existence in the process of life, not individuals. We as individuals, we have a very, very heightened sense of our own importance, but we're not going to be here very long. We're going to be here for a few seconds, and then we'll be gone. But what's important to maintain is the process of life. And um, we are wiping out. We are wiping out all these species. If you, if you, can't, you can't assess the millions of species on the planet individually, but you can use the proxy for all of them, which is they all live someplace. So look at all the habitats. If you look at forests, forests are at the smallest extent ever, and we keep generally cutting them. They're growing back in a few places like the eastern US, but generally they're shrinking everywhere. Grasslands fly over the country and look down. That's what we've done to grasslands around the world. Freshwater is at its most depleted, most deteriorated. Uh, the ocean is depleted. It's acidifying. All the habitats are degrading. And we are degrading every habitat on Earth. And what does that tell us? It tells us that at this point in our history, we are incompatible with life on Earth. That's a bad thing to have on your resume. And we need to leave room and make space. That's what we need to do. Projections are that the spike in human population, after we add another China and another India to the world, people say, oh, there's plenty of food. But they're all going to want wood, and they're all going to want space, and they're all going to want cars. They're all going to want everything. It's not just about, is there enough food? They're going to fight over water. All right? We're supposed to be getting past that spike because hopefully, um, women's rights and women's empowerment will do everywhere what it has done to a few countries, which is where, where women get to decide what they want to do. They recognize that the, the secret of rich people is that smaller families mean bigger lives. So that problem solves itself. But we are faced with wiping out all of the charismatic animals that we most recognize 
before we get there. And it's crucial to leave enough room for viable populations or they will be gone. They will not be able to withstand the onslaught. I'm completely out of time. You had your hand up. It's just a variant on the qu question. When you had a chart up of the uh, countries, let's say, who mostly dumped in the oceans, you saw China way ahead. The US was down at the very, very bottom with right. like 0.01%. Yes. So my question nice is- Nice to feel good about America for a change. But how right? much, no, how much we, how much can we realistically do when you have a world that we are not controlling that is essentially uh, doing their, their bit and at the same time, uh, we had a fascinating lecture here on biomimicry, which um, had many solutions based on animal behavior, including how to use photosynthesis to create water, uh, antibacterial um, materials derived from shark skin, and right, so on. Right. So there's hope, and yet how do you deal with the fact that you have these countries you can't control? Who want what well, we have? I mean, uh, there are countries that, you know, all countries change. You know, when I was in Kenya in 2013, the, the market for ivory in China was completely unregulated and completely out of control. Now, a lot of things have changed about that. They're, they're, they're making it illegal to import ivory. A lot of things change. People said, oh, the Chinese can never change. Well, the United States, you know, probably was the leader in world deterioration for a long time. Then we became the leader in... Um, in protecting nature and protecting the environment, national parks, America's best idea, all that stuff. Now we're destroying the EPA and making cars dirtier again. Uh, so countries change. And um, China's not dumping that stuff at sea. What happens is it's washing into rivers and it's all coming out that way. So um, there's a balance between development and population and better management. It's all very complicated. I am out of time. But there, there's, there definitely is hope. And there are definitely a lot of things all of us can always do to try to be better, not perfect. We can't be perfect, but we can all be better all the time. So I'll see you out there. If anybody wants books, I'll be happy to sign them. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>